I don't know how many of you are joining me on this journey of a slow through the book of James in our New Testament, but I hope that you are. It only takes up four pages in my Bible. It's just five chapters long. We started reading little sections of it last Monday through Friday, took a break on Saturday and today in order to reflect on those readings, and we'll continue reading starting tomorrow through Friday. You can find those daily readings on our website and on our Facebook page, or you can get a listing of them from our office. But we want to study this book slowly and deeply, for it has a lot to say to us about how to live our lives faithfully in the world that we find ourselves in today. So hear these words now from the fourth chapter, beginning with the first verse. What is the source of conflict among you? What is the source of your disputes? Don't they come from your cravings that are at war in your own lives? You long for something that you don't have, so you commit murder. You are jealous for something you can't get, so you struggle and fight. You don't have because you don't ask. And you ask and don't have because you ask with evil intentions to waste it on your own cravings. You unfaithful people. Don't you know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Or do you suppose that the scripture is meaningless? Doesn't God long for our faithfulness in the life that God has given to us? But God gives us more grace. This is why it says, God stands against the proud but favors the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will run away from you. Come near to God, and God will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cry out in sorrow, mourn and weep. Let your laughter become mourning and your joy become sadness. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and God will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, don't say evil things about each other. Whoever insults or criticizes a brother or a sister insults and criticizes the law. If you find fault with the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge over it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and he is able to save and to destroy. But you... Who judge your neighbor? Who are you? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There's a United Methodist pastor and writer who has written many Bible study books that some adult Sunday school classes and several of my churches have enjoyed reading and studying. He's a wonderful storyteller. His name is Reverend James Moore, and he told a story some years ago about a time when he was pastor at St. Luke United Methodist Church in Houston, Texas. He said that his daughter, Jody, was in college at the time at Louisiana Tech University, and one fall she was given the honor of being chosen to be in the homecoming court for the homecoming football game. It was a marvelous honor for her and a great moment in her life. So James Moore and his wife decided they really wanted to be there for their daughter, to be at that football game and to see her march on the field and receive this honor as part of the homecoming court. But the only problem is the game was on a Saturday night, and it started at 8 o'clock. Now, Louisiana Tech is about six hours away from Houston. And James Moore had to preach that next morning at St. Luke's in Houston. 
But he decided, well, you know, it's really important to my daughter, so we're going to go ahead and make that drive and go to the football game, and I'll just be a little bit tired when I get to church to preach on Sunday morning, but it's important, so I'm going to do it. So he did. They went to the football game. It started at 8 o'clock, but you know how homecoming events there was an after party where his daughter was being honored, and so he really did not leave Louisiana Tech University until about midnight for that six-hour drive to Houston. He said as he was driving along around about 2 a.m., he came to a little town called Logansport, Louisiana. He said, it's right at the border, right before you cross over the river to go into Texas. And when he drove in to Logansport, he said it was a sleepy little town, those idyllic sleepy little towns that you read about sometimes. And he thought, there is probably not a single soul that is awake in this town tonight. He didn't see a sign of anyone anywhere but he discovered a few minutes later how very wrong he was. As he was going through the main street there in Logansport, suddenly there was this pickup truck that pulled out of an alley right behind him, and he noticed in his rearview mirror that the person driving that pickup truck reached over on their seat and picked up a hat and put it on. And then he noticed in his rearview mirror that that driver also reached over in their seat and picked up something else and put it on their dashboard. And all of a sudden, he saw this red light just flashing and flashing and flashing. So, of course, Reverend Moore pulled over to the side of the road, and then he got out of his car, and he saw the other person get out of their car, and he noticed on the side of the door as it opened the words, Deputy Sheriff. Now, Reverend Moore describes the scene this way. He says, as I walked towards the Deputy Sheriff, he was a very small man, but he had a swagger in the way that he walked, and he carried a nightstick in one hand that he kept pounding in the other hand. He pulled his jacket back so that I could see his firearm, so that I would know who was in charge around here. And I thought to myself, Barney Fife lives. <laughs> I said to him, Deputy, I'm sorry. Did I do something wrong? Because I, I really didn't know that I had done anything wrong. And the deputy said to me, Something wrong? Yes. You were going 28 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. And Reverend Moore says, Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. He really is Barney Fife. But I said, Oh, I'm so sorry. I try really, really hard to be a law-abiding citizen. I didn't realize I was going 28 miles per hour. I thought I was going 25. I really did. Well, said the deputy, a lot of people think that. They don't realize, but there's a steep hill coming into town, and people accelerate, and they don't realize it. And you did that. You were going 28, and that's against the law. Reverend Moore says, I was praying, oh, dear Lord Jesus, please help me. The deputy sheriff said, what were you doing out here at 2 a.m. in the morning anyway? And Reverend Moore said, oh, well, actually, it's kind of a wonderful story. You see, my daughter just got named to the homecoming court at Louisiana Tech, but I'm a preacher at a church in Houston, Texas, so I went to see my daughter, and now I'm on my way back so I can preach this morning. Three services at my church. The deputy said, you're a preacher, huh? Reverend Moore stood up straight. Yes, I am. The deputy said, 
well, then you ought to know better. You're supposed to be part of the solution, not the problem. And I said what anybody in their right mind would say. I said, yes, sir, you're absolutely right. I'm so sorry. I'll do better next time. And the deputy said, well, I'm not going to give you a ticket this time. I'm just going to give you a warning. But I want you to remember you are supposed to be part of the solution, not the problem. Moore says he drove away and he thought to himself, happiness is Logansport, Louisiana, in your rearview mirror at 2 a.m. <laughs> but then he said, no, I was just kidding. I really thought to myself, you know, he's right. I ought to be part of the solution, not the problem. And here's the thing. So should all of us. My friends, I, I share that story with you because it hit a note within me. It hit a note within me as I think about living faithfully that when we tell people we are a follower of Jesus Christ, we ought to act like a follower of Jesus Christ 24-7, 365, no exceptions, no exclusions, no if, ands, or buts about it. We are to be part of the solution for working for what is better in this world, in our community, in our denomination, in our local church, in our schools, in our families. We are to be part of the solution. Richard Rohr has said that one of the best critiques of something that isn't good is to build something better. And one of the important ways that we can build something better in the world that we find ourselves in is to follow what has become known as John Wesley's general rules. Bishop Reuben Job wrote a little book where he explains what those general rules are. For those of you who aren't familiar with the general rules of the Methodist Church, and his book is titled, Three Simple Rules. Do y'all know what those rules are? Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. They sound simple on the outside, but they're not always simple to live by. What sets us apart as United Methodists and what makes us distinct as a people of God is that we are not just to love God, to praise God, to worship God, to feel and to know about God, but we are called together as a people to actually live the life that Jesus lived here and now. Methodists are not supposed to be, as John Wesley said, almost Christian. We're supposed to be fully Christian. So if anyone asks you what a Methodist is, I want you to say, we're the real deal. We don't just talk about following Jesus, but we seek to follow Jesus by doing no harm, doing good, and staying in love with God. Loving God with all our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our strengths, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Doing that every day, 24-7, 365. Because real faith changes our lives and has the power to transform the world. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, believed that with all his heart, and that's why he gave these rules to his societies and his groups. From the earliest days of seeking faith, when he was at school in England, Wesley and his fellow devoted Christians were made fun of by their classmates as people of the method. That's where we got our name. In other words, his friends thought that they were trying to be real Christians and that that was a joke, that nobody really could do it. But Wesley began to bring his approach of faith to the working people of England, the people in the mines, the people in the fields, 
and they saw what a difference following those general rules could make in their lives. A year after Wesley first preached in the field near Kingswood, a town of coal miners, Wesley wrote these words in his journal. He wrote, Kingswood does not now, as a year ago, resound with cursing and blasphemy. It is no more filled with drunkenness and idle diversions. It is no longer full of wars and fightings, of clamor and bitterness, of wrath and envy. Peace and love are found here. Great numbers of people are mild and gentle and easy to approach. Very unlike a year ago. Real faith, my friends, changes lives and has the power to transform the world. The writer of the New Testament book of James that we are reading understood this. He understood this as he wrote to fellow Christians who were scattered, scattered throughout Asia and Asia Minor because of the persecution that came after Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. They were greatly persecuted by the Romans who believed that Christians had brought bad luck to the Roman Empire because the Christians worshipped only one God instead of all the many Roman gods. And they were being persecuted by the Jewish community at the same time. So James is writing this letter to encourage these Christians who are living in a world that is decidedly unchristian. He's encouraging them to stay strong in the faith, to claim that real faith of doing no harm, doing good, and staying in love with God. And in the text we read today, James makes it clear that one of the important characteristics of a follower of Jesus Christ is humility, seeking to live faithfully, recognizing God as the ruler and guide of our lives. If you look back at the second part of verse 5, it says, Doesn't God long for our faithfulness and the life that God has given to us? But God gives us more grace. God knows we're going to fall and that we're not going to be perfect. God gives us grace and second chances and third chances to get it right. For he longs for our faithfulness. Therefore, James says, submit to God, resist the devil, and the devil will run away from you. Come near to God, and God will come near to you. That's what our stewardship campaign is all about. It's all about being faithful and coming closer to God and knowing that God will come closer to us as we dedicate our time, our talent, and our financial resources to the work that God has called us to do. Now let me brag on you a little bit, because I believe this congregation in so many ways has been and is and will continue to be part of the solution to the world's difficulties and problems. Several years ago, this congregation adopted a motto that set the vision for the church that you are called to be, the church with a heart in the heart of the city. Well, I believe that really what you are doing is you are showing and you are sharing God's heart with this community. You are sharing and showing God's heart to people who are seeking and hurting, to people who are wondering and doubting, to people who have felt left out and excluded. You are showing and sharing God's heart. Let me list for you some of the items that we shared with our district superintendent recently about the ways you are doing that. Through the soup cellar, you serve on average in excess of 500 meals every week. So far this year, you have provided three sit-down meals in Threat Hall for people who are experiencing food insecurity. Those sit-down meals offer persons who have felt excluded from the church. You are offering them respect and dignity and a listening ear, as well as medical services and free haircuts, 
and flu and COVID vaccinations. You continue to have a robust Sunday school and Christian education program with seven very active adult classes, three children's classes, youth activities, a youth Sunday school class, and an active nursery. 12 different small group Bible studies and book discussion groups have been held so far this year. And you've worked with a local home daycare operator who is caring for six low income children in her home. You provided books and toys for those children whose ages range from six months old to four years old. You've supported a low-income child to attend summer camp, a week-long camp at the Methodist camp known as Asbury Hills right here in South Carolina. You provided monthly food supplies as well as hygiene products to children at Alcorn Middle School. And you've provided $5 gift cards to McDonald's for the teachers at Alcorn Middle School to award to children for achievements in reading. You provided tutors to elementary schools. You provided support for San Sarah Flores, our missionary in Ecuador, as well as book bags and supplies for children in that mission. You provided shelf-stable milk to be given out to families experiencing food insecurity through the cooperative ministries. And now, most recently, we've engaged in a partnership with Lutheran Family Services to provide assistance to a refugee family and through Epworth Children's Home to provide support to a foster family. My friends, in all these ways and more, you are using your time, your talent, and your treasure to make a difference in this world, to show and share God's heart with this community. The New Testament writers call this kind of sharing kononia, a place of intimate fellowship and sharing, seeking to build and rebuild inclusive and joyful fellowships with all of God's children. In all of these ways and others, this congregation has been and is about deepening our worship through excellent music. Weren't you touched by the beautiful music so far this morning? It enriches our worship and brings the Spirit of God into our hearts and into our lives. You have been engaged in radical hospitality that demonstrates commitment to loving our neighbors as ourselves, going beyond being nice, because you know that we can't say we love our neighbor if we are indifferent to their suffering, whether it's mental, emotional, psychological, economic, or spiritual suffering. This is a community that is striving to be an instrument of God, a visible sign of God's heart at work in this world, a community on a path of reconciliation with Jesus Christ and with one another, following in Jesus' way of love and life. So I want to encourage you today to continue on this journey in this mission of being the heart of God in this community by recommitting yourselves to grow individually and communally, to grow collectively as a family of God. Because in this place, no matter what we question or doubt, who we love or what we look like, what we feel or don't feel, this community is a safe place a safe place to speak about God, to get to know God, and to be our authentic selves while we're doing that, as we seek an authentic relationship with Christ and with one another. We are met here by a God who loves us and wants that relationship with us and has equipped us with gifts, gifts of time and talent, this is such a talented congregation. We have talents that are being untapped at this moment 
but we want to open up opportunities for you to use those talents in the kingdom of God. We all recognize that the way people engage with church has changed dramatically since COVID entered our lives. And none of us know exactly what the future ministries of this church or any church are going to look like. But what we do know is that the future starts today. The future starts today. God is already at work in our lives and in this community calling us to live into continual growth and help. God is calling us to be here and to continue our outreach to persons who are seeking and hurting, persons who are questioning, persons who are responding and open and hungry for God and God's love and acceptance and affirmation. So I want to ask you to spend some time this week listening for what God is calling you specifically to do. Be open to new and emerging ministries that God may be leading you and us as a congregation to follow. And we're going to give you an opportunity next Sunday to put pen to paper and to make a commitment, to bring that commitment to the altar to be blessed, to write down how you feel God is calling you to use your time, your talent, and your financial resources to grow your heart and to grow the heart of God in this community to continue the good work that God is doing in and through us in faith. Your financial contributions and gifts, of course, will be kept confidential, so please put them in a sealed envelope. And Robbie Douglas, our business manager, will be the only one to open those envelopes and to record those numbers. The card with your time and your talent will be given to our new Director of Engagement and Volunteer Ministries. She'll collate all of that and disseminate your names and your interest to different volunteer leaders and staff people so that we can get back in touch with you about next steps, about how to use your time and your talent in effective ministry. My friends, COVID definitely put a damper on many of the good things that this church and other churches were doing to live out their authentic faith. But now that we're not so worried about using our hands to keep our mask on and keep people at bay, our hands are free. Free to serve, free to hold a hymnal and sing freely with the choir, free to open our Bibles and join a Bible study group or to teach children or youth, free to serve meals through our welcome table or through the soup cellar, free to be fully engaged in mission, being God's heart in the heart of this city. And so I want to invite you to listen for God's call. I chose as our closing hymn today, I don't often choose the hymns, but I've given Nicholas suggestions recently of, of hymns to go along with this sermon series. And He's graciously agreed to play them and to allow us to sing them. The hymn that I chose for us to close today is one that I wasn't really familiar with. It's an old African-American spiritual. And the name of the person who first sang the words is lost to history. It's a song that really was learned as people heard it and repeated it. It's really just a chorus with one word changing here and there but it speaks to my prayer for myself and for all of us. I'm gonna live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. May that be our marching orders. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.